Hi everybody, it's Professor Lung, and this week we will be talking about three different species from three different families, Phagaceae, Geraniaceae, and Ramnaceae. So these are the three species from the three families that you'll be required to know for our class. First off is Quercus gambellii from the Phagaceae family, found on page 364 of your reading. Next is Erodium secretarium from the Geraniaceae family, found on page 370. And finally, we have Cianothus um, integrimus, um, which is in the Ramnaceae family, found on page 396. So we're going to first focus on the Phagaceae family, which includes familiar families like oak trees, as well as chestnuts and beech trees. And again, we're going to be focusing specifically on Quercus gambellii. So our first species is gambel oak, or Quercus gambellii. In terms of its stats, it's a perennial and a native species and often grows as a monoecious shrub or a small tree. And again, monoecious means it, um, the plants, the individuals are not sexually dimorphic. So one single plant will have both male and female flowering portions. Um, the crown of gamble oak trees are typically rounded and they usually grow in dense stands or thickets. The it typically flowers um, from March to April. It's a cool season plant, and the fruits usually mature, ap mature after the first fall of flowering. The inflorescent types um, are what we call catechins, which are essentially a um, slim cylindrical flower cluster or spike, as you can kind of see right here next to me in this bubble. Um, and it usually has uh, very inconspicuous or no petals, and is usually wind pollinated, um, but can sometimes also be insect pollinated. And oftentimes, catechins um, have unisexual flowers, even if it's a monoecious plant. And so, for example, um, we may expect that there are staminate flowers in the catechins, um, which often also appear pendulous. And then we also have pistillate flowers in reduced catechins um, at the branch apex. And so that's at the very tip of the branch. The flowers themselves are, again, unisexual. And so they are kind of um, spatially separated on the plant itself. And they're called a petalus, or um, essentially no petals on those flowers. In terms of its fruits, it typically produces acorns that I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with acorns being in California. Um, and they're often solitary or clustered. And so they can occur on their own, like you see right here, or in a cluster. And it, typically it has an invocular uh, cup, which is essentially a whorl or rosette around the base that kind of closes around the nut. Um, and then it has these kind of scales, which are essentially oppressed um, onto the surface. The nut itself or the acorn is often an ovoid to ellipsoid shape and can um, go from green to light brown in color and often single acorn is a single seed um, and the, the fruits themselves are often subsessile um, or on a very small pedestal. In terms of its vegetative characteristics, it's a cool season plant and it has leaves that are alternate and simple. Simple just means it's not a compound leaf. And again, alternate means it occurs on the same opposite sides of the branch, but are slightly offset, whereas opposite would be directly opposite from each other. Um, the leaves and blades can be highly variable, and they can vary from um, ovate shapes to ob obovate, um, to also oblong and elliptic. Um, and so here's a nice diagram so you can kind of remember your different leaf shapes. Uh, and usually the leaves are deeply uh, lobed, about five to nine lobes um, that come out about halfway to the mid vein on the leaf. The lobes themselves are often rounded. Um, you can't maybe see that well in this photo, but here you can see the lobes are often rounded themselves. They're not sharp, so to speak, or like tooths. Um, and usually the middle and lateral lobes are the largest ones. The bases are gradually tapering um, to the pet, um, to the pet, sorry, to the petiole, um, and typically are asymmetrical. And tapering, if you forgot what that term means, typically means it's becoming thinner or narrower on one end. 
And the leaves are often also coracaceous or also leathery, known as leathery. So the leaves are leathery feeling. Um, and um, adaxily, the leaves are yellowish green and nearly glabrous. And I'll just remind you that adaxily means the upper surface of the leaves, whereas abaxily means the bottom surface of the leaf. AB, bottom, abaxily, lower surface. Um, and the adaxal, the upper surface of the leaf, again, is yellowish green and can sometimes be uh, nearly glabrous, which again means no hairs and smooth. On the underside or the abaxial side of the leaf, um, you often find it is tomentose um, to glabrous glaucus. And so tomentose, again, means densely covered in short, matted, woolly hairs. And glabrous means no hairs. And glaucusy could refer to a color, but in this case, it's probably referring to a powdery substance on the leaf surface. Stems um, typically have slender twigs that are brown to reddish brown and can become grayish brown with age. The bark is often gray and um, deeply fissured, um, so you can kind of see cracks on the branches and the stems, um, and oftentimes scaly feeling or looking. Uh, the lenticles, which again are like stomata on, um, on stems, you can actually see it pretty well on this image here, lenticles here. Uh, sorry, actually, you can't see it here. Lenticles are inconspicuous, and so they're too small to see with the naked eye. And likely that um, little kind of offshoot we're seeing is some issue with uh, new growth or potentially, um, what are they called? Galls. Historically speaking, gamble oak is um, somewhat edible. It does have tannic acid or tannins in them, like most oaks, but they can typically be removed through some um, cooking processes. And oftentimes, indigenous tribes and Native Americans used um, acorn to make acorn flour for different types of soups and um, meals. In terms of forage, it's relatively fair or intermediate forage value for pretty much all livestock classes, including deers um, and other wildlife like porcupine. And the acorns themselves are consumed by all livestock classes. Um, and again, we talked about in class about how um, tree fruits are often very um, rich in nutrition. And so that may be why they're also focused on by different classes of livestock. In terms of habitat, they often occur in valleys, canon, canyons, foothills, and lower mountain slopes and can pretty much handle all kinds of soil textures. Next up, we have the Geraniaceae family, which is the geranium family that might have some common species you're familiar with, like or cultural geranium and also stork's bills. Um, and we're actually going to be going over stork bills plants um, like Erodium cicatarium, which can be found on page 370 of your book. So for the geraniaceae family, we have red stemmed fillery or Erodium cicatarium, a very, very common annual species that's non native and introduced from Europe um, that you'll see all around in many different rangelands, including here in Humboldt. It grows as a four with several stems coming out from the taproot and grows as a rosette basil with basil leaves. And here's the rosette, basically um, the central kind of growth on the ground. And the leaves are basil, which means they grow at the base of the plant, out of the base of the plant um, at the ground. Uh, in terms of its inflorescences, uh, typically it's considered an umbel shaped flower. And so here you can see essentially the umbel um, so these used to be flowers, but now they're seeds. But you can basically see if these were all flowers coming out, it basically makes this umbel shape or an umbrella-like shape. And they are specifically on elongated peduncles, as you can see here. Peduncles are similar to pedicels, except um, they are for flowering portions. And so oftentimes, um, if uh, the, there might be a pedicel, for example, like right here, that comes off of the plant, that extends out the flower. And then there might be peduncles that come out of that stem, um, which connect the flowers and seeds to the main part of the plant. The pedicels themselves, oh, and so sorry, and there can be anywhere from two to 10 flowers on these umbels. The pedicels themselves are glandular pubescent. Um, and so that means they have um, 
secretions or essentially compounds um, on these kind of pubescent hairs, very similar um, or often considered trichomes with secondary chemicals um, or other compounds. The flowers themselves are regular flowers that are perfect, which means they have um, anthers and stigmas in the same flower. And the petals um, have, there are five petals. Often they range from a pink to rose to purple color with, and the petal shape can be elliptic to ovate and uh, very ciliate at the base. The fruits themselves are what we call a schizocarp, which are dried fruits that split into single seeded um, parts when they're ripe. Um, and so here on this image, you can see um, kind of dried up plants that are essentially kind of dehissing and uh, drying and twisting and releasing its seed. And so the carpal bodies, so uh, there are five carpal bodies which are fusiform and tardily dis dehiscent and stiffly pubescent. A carpal is essentially a leaf-like seed-bearing structure um, which, cons uh, constituent, or con which is essentially the innermost portion of the, the flower or the whorl. Um, one or more carpels can sometimes make a pistil, and usually fertilization of the ovary within a carpel is, basically results in seed development. Um, and so it is fusiform, which means it is tapering on both ends or a spindled shape and it's stiffly pubescent, so the hairs are stiff and rough. Uh, the style column that uh, is attached typically coils with a few several turns at maturity, as you can see in the, the images on the slide. Vegetatively speaking, red stem fillery or erodium cicatarium is a cool season plant, and the leaves are often delicate looking and almost fern-like. Um, they are opposite, which means they occur at the basal area, completely opposite from each other and are not offset. The leaves are compound, which means they consist of many multiple smaller leaflets along um, this kind of pinnately arranged leaf. Um, and they're often deeply pinnate, as you can kind of see, and pinnified, um, which means those interior leaves are also pinnated. The lobes of those leaves are often acute and toothed. Um, so that acute means they're a little bit more sharp in angle. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows what tooth means, but it's not actually like our flat teeth. It's more like a, our scissors um, or kind of the sharp tooth that you might expect on a vampire. Spooky. Happy Halloween. Um, <laughs> the leaves can all, or vegetatively, it can also be glandular on the plant. Um, where it's pubescent, and again, these are um, ex excretions of trichomes, essentially. The hairs are often flattened and white, and the stems themselves are what we consider canescent. Canescent is essentially having a fine grayish-white pubescence, um, or they can also be hirsute, and hirsute is basically a thick covering of stiff hairs, um, and oftentimes it can be many-branched. So historically speaking, Erodium cicatarium um, was harvest. The young leaves of this plant could be harvested and eaten both raw and cooked. And it was often indicated that um, compounds from this plant contained an antidote for um, strychnine poisoning, which is another compound that can be produced by other plants, which is uh, toxic to livestock and for, for humans. For forage value, it's especially a great, excellent forage for cattle, sheep, and wildlife, especially in the spring. Um, in terms of habitat, it grows well on in disturbed areas like cultivated fields, waste grounds, roadsides, lawns, mesas, ravines, plains, um, and it's adapted to a broad range of soils, and but mostly occurs abundantly on sandy soils. Next up, we have the Ramnaceae family. And from this family, we'll just be talking about Ceanothus integrimus from page 396. So deer brush or Ceanothus integrimus is a perennial native plant that typically grows as a shrub up to four meters tall and is usually broader than taller, as you can kind of see in this image above me. It's often widely and loosely branched and the branches themselves are often slender and drooping, and the crowns are often rounded 
too irregular. And so that could be patchy or uneven. Um, and it's a warm season plant that flowers from May to June. It reproduces both from seeds and can recover from its root stalk. And the seeds germinate best after fire. And so that's why it kind of has a, a, a good root stalk is a fire adaptation. In terms of its, for deer brush, see note this integromus, its inflorescences are panicled um, and terminal, which means they occur at the end of the branching, and they can be simple or compound flowers. The flowers are also perfect and regular, so they have all the parts. And the calyx have five lobes and are typically united below um, the lobes. And uh, they are, it can be white and sharply curved between the petals. There are also five petals, which range from um, whitish to pink to dark blue and often are pipe shaped, as you can kind of see here and here. And long clawed. It often has five stamens opposite from the petals, and the styles are three cleft um, near the apex, and cleft is just a fancy way to say lobed for, um, for styles instead of like leaves and flowers. And it has very distinct looking flowers, and it has a very great distinct um, smell as well. The fruits um, often occur in capsules that separate into three carpels, each with one seed as they mature. Vegetatively speaking, it's a warm season plant. The leaves are alternate and simple, which again means it's not a compound leaf. And the blades are ovate to oblong. And it's typically apexly acute to rounded. And so that means at the tip of the leaf, it would be either be um, kind of a, an acute angle or slightly rounded. The base is typically rounded. The margins are entire, which means there's no breaking up or serration of this margin right here. And it has distinctly three veined. Um, and so here you can see one, two, three distinct veins come out from the petiole, whereas these are secondary veins that we see branching off this kind of primary mid vein. And so these distinct three veins are the ones that are specifically coming off of um, that petiole, as you can kind of see in these images. The stems often have slender twigs that are also often drooping. And um, the stems themselves can be yellowish green and can often become warty. Historically speaking, Ceanothus integrimus was extracted, um, sorry, chemicals, or sorry, uh, compounds were extracted from the bark and used as a tonic to produce a soapy lather, um, essentially for cleaning. And it has flexible stems that were also utilized for basket weaving. And it's a very valuable honey plant as well. It's often known as the bee's knees. And, uh, um, and a lot of other pollinators may be interested in, in it as well. In terms of forage, it's good to excellent for cattle, sheep, goats, and deer. Um, and it's relatively fair for horses. Um, and also a very important resource for small mammals, uh, like quails and other birds um, who also eat seeds or ceanothus seeds. In terms of its habitats, it typically occurs on mountain slopes and ridges and is adapted to a broad range of soil types. And it's most abundant in well-drained soils. And that's it for this week. I hope you had a nice week and see you soon. Oh, last point. It uh, typically occurs in sun to partial shade and it cannot tolerate 